Good afternoon, happy Saturday everybody. I am trying to catch up with some videos here and uh, shout out to Blackout for bringing this up to my attention. There's actually some interesting developments. This video is about the Muskogee Nation of Florida. Now, obviously I've talked about the Muskogee Nation of Oklahoma, which is my tribe, talked about the Porch Band, which is in Alabama. There's a Machise Band of Lower Creek Indians. I think they're in Florida. You have the Perdido Bay tribe, which I think might also be in Florida. I need to double check their locations. Um, I did a video about sort of their, their powwow stuff, right? This is gonna be a kind of a contrast to them um, in a significant way. I spent much of the, of the day, much of the morning for sure, reading the website of the Muskogee Nation of Florida, formerly known as the Florida Tribe of Eastern Creek Indians before 2001 when they changed the name to the current name. These are people that avoided the 1837 removal, kind of like the Porch Band and other groups. Um, basically, they have an interesting history because they can't get federal recognition until they meet certain criteria. They have a lot of documentation in-house about their family uh, histories and things like that, but as far as external recognition, they don't, they haven't had that. Uh, not enough of it anyway, not enough over decade upon decade upon decade because, well, we'll get into that. Basically, from uh, Florida law from 1852, because what happens, they left Alabama and they, uh, they went to what is now Bruce, Florida. Um, Florida law in, uh, you know, in, 1852 basically declared that you, you had to be either white, black, or mulatto. Michael, shh. Um, white, black, or mulatto, you could not be Indian. Indian no longer existed as a race, right? That's what they're saying. And I've heard things like that as well. It, it, it could very well be true. I mean, they wanted us to not exist. So um, you just legally declare that we don't exist and that we don't exist anymore. And that's pretty much, um, that's kind of the thing. I, I, I know that in, in recent times you've had people that want to just simply pass a law to make certain things non-existent, like people literally wanting to pass a law, making the four years of Trump's administration literally non-existent to like wipe it from the historical calendar. Like people actually want to do that, which is ludicrous. I don't care what side of the political spectrum you're on, okay? Like that's just a ludicrous thing to want to do, but people want to do that. People who are educated have wanted to do things like that, okay? So, yeah, it's not outside of the realm of, um, of likelihood that this claim is actually correct. Um, that part, of the 1852 legal claim, I need to look into more specifics. I need to go on the Florida website. I need to go on things like that. But <clears throat> um, this is what they say. I've heard the same thing um, before this. Um, they have the pine. <sighs> Sorry. Michael, you want some water? He had a bunch of chocolate milk powder and I took it away from him and he cried. Anyways, the, the Pine Level School, Michael, here, drink some water. I don't want to hear you talking, okay? I'm busy. Every time I try to talk, he, he does that either on purpose or by accident. I don't care. Um, <clears throat> Pine Level School established uh, 1890 basically run by uh, members of the Indian community. Um, closed 1954, uh, became the Bruce's Women's Club, who, and they later, you know, they later returned it back to the tribe for ownership. Um, there's been Bruce Methodist Church records of this Indian population from 1912 until the present time. They've been maintaining a record of these people. Um when the 1947 BIA land claim settlement happened, which, you know, my, my tribe was involved in, that's how the Porch Bend basically got their land and got their, their you know, their chunk of real estate and recognition was around that time under uh, Calvin McGee. Well, they got in on this too, and they actually won some of that. Ironically enough, they had to kind of like, you know, do a lawsuit against Cree Nation of Oklahoma as well, I guess, apparently, for some weird reason. Uh, but anyways, 1957, that was resolved. Uh, but they didn't get payments until 1971. 1974, Michael, shh. 1974, uh, Florida created the Northwest Florida Creek Indian Council on their behalf. In 1978, they wrote their own constitution. And in 1986, they gained Florida state recognition. 
Uh, some of the requirements for membership are uh, they have, ha have to have ancestors on the church records from 1912 to 1917. So they have to have an ancestor going that far back to, to be recognized within this group, by the group itself, I guess. Um, they have to have descent from an 1832 Parsons and Abbott rule Creek Indian person. And they also, they also have to have active ties to the Bruce community. The majority of these people live like like pretty close within the 50-mile radius or whatever that's required. Um, so, yeah, they're located in Bruce, Florida. The roles are closed at the moment. Big surprise. I think the porch band also closed their roles, which, you know, I'm kind of questioning what that means. Does that mean that they're closing it to other possible descendants that are not on the 1912 to 1917 roles? Kind of like we don't allow people who, are out, who don't have ancestors on the final Dawes role, is it is that what it means to have closed roles, or are they just not taking in new families that actually do have ancestors on the roles, but but didn't get enrolled between like 1986 and the present time? I don't know. I don't know. I'm curious about that. So, um, I'm I am really curious about that because if there's other people that should be accepted by the other criteria, I, I think they should be accepted too, but um, that's just me and my thoughts. So here's where it gets interesting. I looked at the pictures of the people. The people ethnically look pretty, like, light-skinned. But many of them also have native features too. Like, some, you can see the head shape of some of these guys. It's obvious they've got Indian blood. It's pretty obvious that some of them have that. Um, some of the women, it's obvious. Some of the women and men, it's not so obvious. Um, some of the children, it's obvious. It, it, it's, it's really hit or miss because they're a multi-ethnic group now. Like, the guy who, um, there's a guy named Dan Pinton who's a tra the traditional chief. I'm, I'm, only, I'm not doing this out of disrespect. I'm doing it to kind of distinguish between what I know to be true, which is the Oklahoma stuff, and what is presumed to be true here as well. Um, Dan Pinton, who looks very white, has a beard, you know, very light hair, uh, light skin complexion. Um, I don't know what his clan is. I don't know what his, you know, any of that stuff about the guy. Um, but he's apparently the traditional chief of their group. He's their medicine man. Apparently learned, I, I guess his grandfather was a medicine man, so he learned some of that. He's also a former archaeologist, so he's familiar with Swanson's writings. I'm going to get into that in a minute, okay? But he's, he's also the custodian of the sacred bundle. Now, I've known about sacred bundles since, um, well, probably about a good like 10 15 years i've heard of medicine bundles and having sacred objects medicine things like that and they're passed on from one generation to the next i think that the um i think i remember reading something about the Thalplaco tribal town um medicine man giving the bundle to the pine arbor uh group of creek indians uh some some time ago Anyways, um, that's how I first heard about the bundles. And then my mom, I got a copy of David Lewis Jr.'s book on Creek Medicine, which I haven't really read. My mom kind of read it, but she talked to me about that. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, it sounds kind of familiar, you know, because I read about the uh, Pine, Ar Pine Arbor group and some of that. So I'm familiar with the idea of sacred bundles, but I'm just curious, like, I mean, apparently there's some old stuff here, apparently like a medal given from James, President James Madison. So... Um, they got some similarities and some differences to the way we do things. Now, they do dance counterclockwise. Uh, apparently, um, okay, so I'll get into this a little bit here. So they call their tribal town, which is what, what they call their ceremonial grounds, White Earth Tribal Town. The term white here gets very interesting as well, okay? Um, I don't know why they call it White Earth. I also don't know why they, they, they now call the black drink... Um, um, they call the black drink the white. They still make the black drink, but now they call it instead of uh, the black drink, they call it uh, uh, asihutki, which is uh, the white drink. I don't know why they're calling it the white drink. I guess other than for healing, is healing properties or whatever. Now I'm kind of like going, yeah. did they reconstruct this stuff from books? I mean, supposedly they didn't, but they got a lot of guys here who know a lot about books and the history from the books. Okay. Like Dan Penton is a former archaeologist. Now, he said that he learned a lot of stuff from growing up and that that helped him in interpreting the archaeological digs that he found, like, in Florida. He's like, no, this is a square grounds. So he could be legit. He, he might very, very well be legit. And his perspective is, I'm focusing on keeping the traditions alive. We'll let the uh, chairwoman, which is Ann Denson Tucker, 
let her deal with trying to get us federally recognized. I'm trying to maintain our tribal ways and pass on the next generation. Apparently, the Hichiti language, uh, which is, all, is almost extinct, but they still speak it, at least as of the article I read from 2015, which is only about seven years ago. Well, getting close to eight now. Um, but yeah, so Dan Penton is familiar with Swanton's writings, though. But he admits that. But he says that his understanding isn't from purely from the books. It's actually, you know, he actually learned some from his grandfather. Um, like, his knowledge of the archaeological stuff is not purely from the science standpoint, although he, he's learned that. He interprets, he interprets it from his education growing up, he says. And that's, that's very believable. It's very possible. Um, I speak as if I'm critical because I'm trying to create a, um, an argument for both ends of the, of the spectrum here. I'm always critical when it comes to any group saying, oh, we practice traditional medicine and they're not actually living in Oklahoma because that is what the medicine passed on. That's where it still exists. Um, that's where the original ceremonial grounds ended up. It doesn't mean you can't create new ceremonial grounds, but you need a song, you need the medicine, and you need the people, okay? So, um, and there's other things, a lot of other stuff involved as well. So, they have a, a ceremonial grounds called White Earth Travel Town. Travel Town. They have, they have a medicine man who apparently learned stuff from his grandfather. Um, you have language, but it's it's becoming almost extinct, which means that what language are they speaking at the ceremonials, and what songs are they singing? Do they, are they even singing traditional songs? I don't know what the ceremonials look like, other than the picture I saw of everyone bringing a plate of food to the ceremonial fire, which does not have the four logs, by the way. I mentioned that in yesterday's video, and I've, I've seen this at the uh, Stomp, the Crete Nation annual festival stomp dance. I've seen it in photographs of the actual ceremonials that, that again, I mentioned before were taboo. Like, you shouldn't take pictures of that. Um, I mean, one log is north, one is south, one's east, one's west. That's the way it's done. Um, I didn't see that in this picture. It doesn't mean that the, that the logs weren't there. They didn't just burn up. I, you know, but they're offering plates of food um, to the creator on this sacred fire. Which is interesting, and I don't know really if that's an actual traditional practice. Um, but in any case, um, I also wasn't raised in the traditional way, so I don't totally know everything. But I take a lot of things with a grain of salt for important reasons. So, um, again, Machis band of, you know, powwow type stuff. I have to look at that and say, I'm sorry. They probably really are Creek Indians, but their name conventions are totally off. I don't know how much of the naming conventions got passed on to this group. I haven't read enough of that. So I have to figure that part out. Um, I'm going to do more research on these people for sure because it's an interesting, very interesting thing. Now, one thing I'll say is that they have a lot of very nice Seminole patchwork clothing. Seminole is not the same as Creek, but it's almost the same. But since they lived in Florida, according to their story... They've been living in Florida since they left Alabama. It's totally possible that they may have at some point acquired patchwork from Seminoles. Not to mention a lot of Seminoles were actually Creek to begin with, but the Creeks weren't dressed the way that the Seminoles, generally speaking, were dressed. Not that Oklahoma Creeks haven't adopted Seminole patchwork themselves at times. I've seen that. But, um, but as far as like saying this is the Creek way, they have ribbon shirts too. But, it, but again, in my observation, the ribbon shirts are not quite as historical. Like they're, they're about a hundred plus years old, but they're not like, that doesn't go back to Alabama and Georgia. As far as I can tell, all the artwork I've seen has like calico fabric that looks a little bit different. Um, and, and to be honest, they all dress a little bit different from one another. All these, uh, ancient chiefs, but just look at them, compare Macintosh to Puthali Hola to, you know, to Minowa to, um, Puthali Miko and, and all these other guys, you know, and still looked on, you know, Compare and Benjamin Perryman, who's wearing buckskins. The only thing that's more in common with the rest of them is the turban he wore, but he didn't have a metal band on it. Okay, so they all dress a little bit different, um, but they didn't dress like they weren't wearing the seminal patchwork though. But these guys are, so that's kind of I'm going. Oh, maybe they adopted. Maybe their ancestors did adopt it from the Seminoles. I don't know. I don't know. Um, their art. They have some beautiful artwork. I mean, one thing that I wish that we would do a little bit more as a tribe is be a little more archaeological like they are because, like these guys are, because um, 
I've seen some of this work before, and um, like they have necklaces that are basically replicas of shell carvings from like the Mississippi and mound builder culture and things like that. Stuff that we have not done since then, but we know is a part of our cultural heritage, and um, it's pretty cool. They've been recreating pottery that's the same style of, of pottery that existed back then. There is this sort of like thing where you like, it's it's not a. Um, it's not for turning milk. It's like for other things. Like you're 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 crushing food in this long tube shaped thing with a handle. Um, the Seminoles do it. These guys also do it. So I think there's there's been a lot of carryover from the Seminole tribe and just the fact that they're in Florida. But uh, they tend to have a lot more stuff that's you know Creek. They have things that are historically Creek. But I wonder almost too much how historical it is. Or rather, it's almost too historical. Meaning, okay, so the modern um, Creek ceremonial grounds have the brush arbors. They have people set up according to clan and, and stuff I mentioned in my last video. They have the fire, the four logs. You, you have all that type of stuff. Um, but every ceremonial grounds is a little bit different. I don't know where, and this could have been a, like, kind of like with a porch band, it could have just been a whole mix mash of different uh, Creek Indians from different tribal towns that sort of, like, banded together and said, let's get the heck out of here. Let's, let's go in the trees. Let's marry our second cousins because these people did the same thing. They, they kind of had to to maintain Indian blood. So, um, and the porch band, yeah, porch band did the same thing again. So, uh, that's why all, all the McGees are related, like, two or three times, four or five times over. So, anyways... Um, so I'm not taking a crack at these people. I think that what they have is actually pretty fascinating. And I think it's probably real. It's probably legit. Um, but again, like, I don't know if the songs are being done in Muskogee or, or Hitchiti, you know, I don't know what's, what they're doing exactly. Cause I, I'm not there. Uh, I, I have seen no videos or recording of any of their stuff, which would make sense if it's legit because you're not supposed to be recording that stuff. So... Um, these guys seem very in the know. There's a guy named F. Kent Riley III, I believe, from Texas. He's an anthropologist, and he's an adopted member of the of, the, of their ceremonial grounds. Uh, I don't think he's Indian, um, I, but he's like a friend of theirs. Now, there's the ceremonial grounds, and there's the tribe itself, which is, is again, run by Ann Denson Tucker. So it's very interesting. Um, the fact that he traced back to the, uh, the Parson Abbott role, means they are actual Creek Indians by blood. So whether their other stuff is legit or not, in the, in, the, in the sense of being passed on from one generation to the next in an unbroken line, that's a different story. They adopted Christianity, Methodist, which is not really a big surprise because a lot of Creek Indians became Methodists, many became Baptists, and early on you had a lot of Presbyterians. Or not maybe a lot, but you had some Presbyterians. Um, but yeah... As I mentioned in the previous video, like the Presbyterian hymnals became like, or their readers became adopted by the Baptists later on. There's stuff that they basically, they carried over from one different church to the next and as it related to the Muskogee people. So in Oklahoma, but yeah, so these people have some interesting stuff. They have something that's worth talking about and worth talking about in a good way. Here's the thing. I don't know how much of this is a reenactment. I don't, I don't know how much of it is. Okay. We are Creeks for sure. Some of us have a few things that have been passed on. Let's gather all this historical data, archaeological stuff, recreate it, and start, and that, that'll become our thing now. Or if some of this stuff is already in place. Now, artistically, like, like, like all the pottery and stuff and the shell carvings, they clearly got that from the archaeological record. That's not something that was passed on from one generation to the next. Clothing, I don't know, but they, they probably got a lot of that from the Seminoles, I'm guessing, who are uh, our sister tribe, basically. So... But as far as like the ceremonial grounds, which is the more important thing, I mean, that could very well be a solid, legit thing. But the fact that it's called white earth and the black drink is not called the white drink, it could have to do with, with ritual purity and peace and things like that. It, it may have something to do with the fact that most of them look kind of white. I don't know. At least I'm cracking a joke. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so anyways, it's very interesting stuff to look at. Um, 
I'll try to find a good picture and make it the icon of this video because I think it's worth doing. Um, I'll share a couple links to the websites to look at, both the official website and also the article uh, that mentions Dan Penton. So all the stuff about like White Earth Travel Town, the, the black dream being called White Drink, Dan Penton, you know, the Hitchity language and F. Kent Riley, all that stuff is from a different website. And so, but if you go on the main website, you'll find a bunch of cool stuff. A lot of pictures of these people. Um, again, mostly dressed in kind of similar patchwork, kind of ribbon dresses, but they do have like a ribbon dance and they have, they have some dances and stuff basically that is kind of like at least has the same name as the stuff that we have in Oklahoma. So I would like to assume that what they're doing has been passed on from one generation to the next. I don't hundred percent know if that's true or not. I know for sure. Again, some of the physical, some of the physical culture has been acquired through archeology. span I would like for us of, a, of the Oklahoma, you know, Creek Nation to eventually do more of that stuff. And then we do. I think, what is it? His name's Charlie Johnson, I think. Um, I think it's Charlie. He makes a bunch of, um, of those metal gorgets. And um, you've got others out there doing a lot of artwork, too. And in the Bow Shooter Society, you got John John Brown doing some stuff, making canoes, making bows. He learned from the late and great Mike Berryhill, uh, who had the pleasure of meeting and, and had the opportunity to go... Um, which I didn't take at the time uh, to make bows. And then when I came back, he had cancer and was sick and never saw him again. So God rest his soul. He was a nice guy um, and a very important man. So to me and to those in the Creek Bowshire Society and, and also to those probably in the other Bowshire Societies too um, because we all kind of got together and did stuff. So anyways, um, good luck to these people. I want to see more of them because I want to know more about them. Um, I, I'm leaning more in the direction of their stuff is probably more legit than not. Um, what I do find fascinating is they found these old cups that have um, trace elements of, of Ilex Vomitoria, which is the uh, Yupon Holly that was used to make the black drink. And so they, they have some of these old cups that they've, that they've recovered. And... Um, and yeah, they make the black drink. I don't know how much, how many of us in Oklahoma actually do that. I don't know how much stuff was lost. I know that, you know, there were certain peaches. There's a, there's a certain, um, and this is in the Muscogee Nation news. There's a peach tree that was carried over by certain ancestors on the Trail of Tears and planted in Oklahoma. And, but then it became endangered in more recent times. They're trying to kind of bring back those particular peach trees into a greater number so that they don't die out. So I don't know how many plants were taken from the old homeland to the new homeland. Those who are still kind of in the old homeland, or at least right next, they're adjacent to it, um, they have greater access to some of these, um, uh, like, plants and also other things. And it's cool. And the good thing is, like, look, the fact is they have Indian blood, according to the records here. Um they're not just some Indian enthusiasts saying, oh, yeah, I'm an Indian and, uh, you know, woo, 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 you know, and, and then doing their whole thing. And, and, and then generations later, they, they, their, their descendants are still claiming to be Indians that are pretty much acting and reenacting, you know, some reconstruction of Creek culture. Um, these people actually are Creek Indians are just heavily mixed, like a lot of us in Oklahoma or from Oklahoma. And... Um, so no big surprise there. Like I, you know, there's not very many that I've seen in pictures that have super dark skin. They're all some shade of white in terms of complexion, but some, a darker shade of white, if that makes sense. Like I've seen so-called full bloods in Oklahoma that to be honest, were not much darker than some of these guys. And who had some very similar features as some of them. That's why I say they, some of them definitely look Indian, but some of them it's like, eh, some look pretty white. So, but it doesn't mean they don't have Indian blood. Okay, like again, the um, as mentioned in yesterday's video, the lady that wrote this video, uh, Billy Billy Jane McIntosh, she looked very white because her mother was white, her dad was Indian, mixed blood, but but looked Indian. So it happens. My little boy, like my wife, is very dark Colombian. She obviously has native blood, uh, probably more than I do. Okay, this boy is very light complected. He's got some Spaniard blood, and he's got my dad's blood. My dad was totally white. So it happens. You know, mix, intermixing happens. Um, they seem, this group, I'll say before I close this up, I don't want it to go too much longer, but basically they do have sort of a matrilineal type of thing, they claim. 
Uh, they do mention clans. And uh, but I'm not sure how prevalent the clans are. I don't know how, how much of the matrilineal lineage is, is maintained. They are ha struggling to teach the traditions of the, the new generation because of video games, which, um, you know, totally understandable. Okay. So anyways, I w Shh, Michael, um, I wish these, these people the best of luck. I want to see more of what happens with them and, and if they get federal recognition. Um, there's a catch-22 because... Because you couldn't be allowed to be Creek, you weren't allowed to be Indian in Florida for a long time. Like you couldn't declare yourself ethnically Indian, so they couldn't really do the whole. Oh yeah, well from th this decade and that decade, and all the census records were Indians. They couldn't do that, so they actually couldn't really. Some of the current requirements for federal recognition, as I understand it, from what they're saying, uh, is just not possible. Um, Yet they have acquired some of the Parson and Abbott, you know, uh, because of Parson and Abbott descendants, um, they did get some of the land settlement claims in, uh, from the 1947 claim. So that means they really are Creek Indians. So anyways, um, best luck to them. Um, I hope everything uh, works out with them. Uh, and I, I hope to see more developments in the future. I hope uh, they... I'm sure they've learned from us as well as some Swanton as well. Okay. But, um, hopefully we can learn some stuff from them. I I'm always intrigued when other people who want to get more in touch with their roots, actually look into the physical culture of it and start recreating that stuff because the live, those of the living, you know, culture passed on don't always maintain that stuff. How many breech cloths do you see running, you know, the, the traditional creeks in, in Oklahoma running around in? I don't know. But I, I knew I know that I see the ribbon shirts, but that's almost that's again like a hundred years or so we've been wearing those. Before that, we weren't wearing that stuff really. Now you got people in South America wearing those things. I'm serious. So it's not like it's it's a totally purely Creek Indian or Southeastern Indian piece of clothing. Uh, the breech cloths we had, the specific ones that we wore as Creeks, that is something we wore back then. And it is something that maintained into the middle of the 20th century. And some reenactors today use it. I don't know how many traditionalists wear those at the stomp grounds today or how many of them were wearing them at um, the stickball games. I hope there's a lot of that going on. But um, I, I want to see more of the historical, physical culture come back within our tribe. These people are recreating that, and I think it's pretty cool. Um, I would like to do more of that myself, to be honest. I just think it's awesome. So um, as a guy who's done a lot of Scottish reenactment, I've, I've done my own research into Scottish dirks and how they should be constructed properly, the, the targe shields, how they should be constructed. And I've been trying to research lately how um, the gunstock clubs and the different war clubs of our tribe actually look like. There's there's sparse information on that, unfortunately. Like There's no physical um, examples other than the Cherokee ones, which do look like the, you know, depictions of some of the stuff that we had. So... It, uh, you know, we can borrow stuff from portraits of other tribes that were around us, but um, saying 100% for sure this gunstock club is exactly Creek Indian, it's hard to say that with 100% certainty. The Ball War Club is a little bit easier to say, um, but there are general southeastern style of, of war clubs, and I want to make some of those. And you know, I plan on doing that as time and funds allow. Wood is not getting cheaper. It's all getting more expensive. And, um, but yeah, I love recreating the physical culture of these, uh, ancient times. So, um, so yeah, part of me is very impressed by these people. And, uh, but part of me is also looking at what else they're doing going, oh, it seems like they actually might be a legit ceremonial grounds. Maybe. And uh, it sounds like they've got a guy, but it sounds like the language is disappearing. So how much is the tradition really passing on? The question then becomes, can you pass on the ceremonial grounds without having the Muskogee language or the Achiti language or the Yuchi language in the case of, of the Yuchi ceremonial grounds? But Yuchi is almost an extinct language, yet you have three ceremonial grounds that are connected with the Yuchis. Are they doing it in Muskogee or are they doing it in Yuchi? So can, can it be done in a different language and still be considered legitimate? Does only the song have to be done in the traditional fashion? Could the rest of it be done in English or Spanish or whatever the language? That's my question. But anyways, that's all for another day. Let me know what you all think. And um, yeah, again, thanks to Blackout for bringing this up to my attention. There's a lot of other stuff he sent me that I'm, 
I'm still having to delve through. I just need to find time. But I had, when I saw this article, I was like, oh man, I've got to, I've got to dig into this more. This is particularly fascinating because of all the, the reasons mentioned here. So anyways, guys, um, check, check with you guys later. Uh, Mado.